Sing your 
as we are journeying, journeying through the New Testament on Sunday mornings, we're going through the Old Testament on Thursday nights. We're in the book of Jeremiah on Thursday nights, if you want to join us at 7 o'clock. Uh, but this morning we continue our study in John chapter 8. And let's, uh, let's stand together as I read the passage for us this morning. Uh, John chapter 8, we made it to verse 12, where it says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, Where is your father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away, and you will seek me, and will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. So the Jews said, Will he kill himself? Because he says, Where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, You are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Then they said to him, Who are you? And Jesus said to them, Just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. They did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself. But as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things that please him. As he spoke these words, many believed in him. And Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for these verses. Uh, Lord, we pray and ask that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher, that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to the things in your word this morning. Lord, I pray and ask that your spirit would be upon me to teach your word this morning. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So in chapter 8, uh, Jesus gets into a series of confrontations uh, with the religious leaders of the Jewish people, and these confrontations uh, escalate, they get very heated, uh, to the point that the religious leaders uh, begin to uh, insult Jesus and even call him a racial slur, as we're going to see in our study next week. Um, the context of this passage is the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem at the temple. And the Feast of Tabernacles was one of the three main feasts or celebrations of the Jewish people. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles was the biggest celebration for the Jewish people all year. Uh, and it takes place there at the, in Jerusalem, as I said, and it commemorated God's faithful provision for the Israelites during their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness under Moses. Uh, and during the Feast of Tabernacles, there were two ceremonies in particular 
that the Jewish people observed on each of the eight days of the feast, and Jesus used those two ceremonies to declare his identity as God. He used those two ceremonies as, uh, as a visual illustration and as a teachable moment to declare to the people who he is. Uh, we looked at the first ceremony in chapter 7 with the, uh, the water ceremony, the pouring out of the water at the temple. You may remember that. Uh, and and um, Jesus in that ceremony back in chapter 7 that's when he declared, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And he said this to mean that he is the source of living water. And in the Old Testament, Jehovah is the source of, of living water. Uh, if, you missed, if you missed our study in John 7, it's on our website. You can go there and listen to it. Uh, and so now, in chapter 8, we come to this second ceremony. And this second ceremony uh, is the lighting of the lampstands in the temple. It's also called the illumination of the temple. And what they would do is in the temple, in the court of the women, where the treasury was located, and we're told in verse 20 that Jesus is in the treasury, so he's in that court, uh, they have these four ginormous lampstands there. And every night of the Feast of Tabernacles, they would light these lampstands. Uh, these lampstands were, were about 75 feet high. Uh, and every night, a guy would climb up a ladder and set these lampstands on fire, light them up, these four huge lampstands, and they would, uh, they would illuminate the whole city of Jerusalem. Uh, the light was so bright. Uh, every Every building in Jerusalem was illuminated by the light of these four lampstands. Um, there's, uh, there's even one uh, writing that we have from that time. Uh, it's, it's exaggerated, but it gives you an idea. Uh, it says that you could see the light of the lampstands all the way up in Galilee. They were so bright, which is not possible, but uh, that gives you the idea. So the whole city would be illuminated by these four lampstands that were lit in the court of the temple. And these lampstands would burn all night uh, into the morning. And, and remember, you know, there's no electricity. Uh, so these were like the only source of light in the city, and all of the city was illuminated by these lights. I have a picture for you, actually, to give you kind of a visual image of, of what it was. So this is the court of the women at the, tab, at the uh, temple. I painted this yesterday afternoon for you guys. Uh, just, you know, Afternoon with some watercolors. Uh, but you can see the four lampstands there. You can see the people to kind of give you a, a, a reference of how large they are. Uh, and they, they only lit these during the Feast of Tabernacles. Uh, they were there all the time, all year, but they would only light them during each night of the Feast of Tabernacles. They would burn all night uh, and they would illuminate the city. And these, uh, these four lampstands they represented the pillar of fire that guided the children of Israel when they were in the wilderness. Remember that? And the pillar of fire that guided the children of Israel, that provided light for the children of Israel while they were in the wilderness um, under Moses. Uh, that pillar of fire was a visual manifestation of God's presence with Israel. God was present with them uh, in the form of that pillar of fire, giving them light. Their light source was God. Um, just to share a verse with you, you don't have to turn there, but Psalm 118, verse 27, it says, God is the Lord and he gives us light. <clears throat> and when the children of Israel were in the wilderness, God literally gave them light in the pillar of of fire and that lampstand, it reminded them, those lampstands reminded them of God's presence with them in the wilderness. Those lampstands were also, uh, also represented the fact that God would one day in the future send his Messiah, who would also bring light once again to the children of Israel. So it, that lampstand looked back to God's presence with Israel in the pillar of fire 
in the wilderness, but it looked ahead to when the Messiah would come. And the Messiah would once again bring light to the children of Israel, to God's people. His light will come into the world again. And I'll share some verses with you that speak of that. Um, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. Again, these are verses about the Messiah. They're messianic passages. Uh, It says, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walk in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. There it says this light, and it's, and it's a re- reference to the Messiah, it will shine in Galilee of the Gentiles. When the Messiah comes, he's going to come to Galilee, and his light will shine in Galilee. Uh, Isaiah 42, another one. Isaiah 42, verse 6. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. So this is the Lord God speaking to the Messiah. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold you, hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. The Messiah will be, will come to Galilee and he will be a light to the Gentiles. How many of you are Gentiles? How many of you are non-Jews? Most of us here if not all of us here. So the Messiah, when he comes, he's going to be a light to the Gentiles. Isaiah 49, uh, verse 6. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. The Messiah will be a light to the Gentiles, and he will bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Uh, One more for us. Isaiah chapter 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising." So in the Jewish mind, for those that are there in the temple that morning when Jesus shows up, in the Jewish mind, the lampstands were a physical reminder of the fact that God was present with them in the wilderness. And it was a reminder that God would one day send his Messiah who will once again bring light to the children of Israel. Okay, is everybody with me on that? So that's the context now of verse 12. Look at verse 12 in John chapter 8. That's the context when Jesus, who's there in the court of the women, where those lampstands stood, when he says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Jesus declared he is the light. He is the light. He is the manifestation of. Of God. He is the Messiah who was to come and bring light to God's people. Now, we want Jesus to make a a very, um, a very clear, unmistakable statement about his deity. We want we want Jesus to say something as simple as I am God. Or I am God. And here's five proofs that I am God. We want Jesus to tell us he's God in a way that we understand in 21st century Western culture. But Jesus isn't living in 21st century Western culture. He's living in the first century in a Jewish culture. And so he communicates to that crowd in a way that they understood what he was saying. They understood that he was declaring that he is God, that he's He's God incarnate, that he is God with them in their presence in a way that made sense to them. You know, that crowd in the temple understood what Jesus meant by the statement in verse 12. He's the God of the Old Testament. He's Jehovah. He is the one that was present with Israel in the wilderness as a pillar of fire. I am the light of the world. Now this, this is, uh, if you're a note taker, this is the second I am statement that Jesus made in the Gospel of John. 
And we've talked about this before, but remember the I am is the Old Testament covenant name of God from Exodus chapter 3. Uh, when God called Moses to lead the children of Israel, to go back to Egypt and lead the children of Israel out of their bondage, to set them free, Moses said to God, well, what if they ask me your name? <laughs> what should I tell them? And in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, God said, tell them I am that I am. Tell them that I am sent you. I am is that Old Testament covenant name for God. And, and it, it, it means that God is, is self-existent, that he's eternal. He's always existed. That's why his name is in the present tense. That's why it's I am, because he has always existed and always will exist and he doesn't change. Uh, his name is not I was. He's not a, he's not a past tense God. And it's not uh, I will be. It's I am. He's always present tense because he's eternal. You know, he, has, he has no past. He has no, you know, it's, he's just present tense with God. And Jesus here, he used that Old Testament name for God in verse 12. I am. And he applies it to himself. And by doing this, he is claiming to be God. He's claiming to be the self-existent God. And he's going to use the name again down in verse 24. You look down in verse 24. He says, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now, you notice in your Bible that the word he is in italics. Do you see, guys see that in your Bible? That means that it's not in the original, that the English translators added that word, and that's why they put it in italics. Uh, and so if you read it again without that word, uh, therefore I say to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. That's the Old Testament name for God. Uh, look down in verse 28. Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. You see the word he is in italics again. So there he says, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. He's declaring his deity there. Uh, look over in verse 58 at the end of the chapter. This one's really clear. Verse 58, Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He's declaring his deity. He's saying that he's the God of the Old Testament. That he's the Old Testament covenant God. I am. In fact, look at the next verse. Look at verse 59. After Jesus made this statement, before Abraham was, I am, then they took up stones to throw at him. They want to kill him. Why? For blasphemy. For, for stating that he's God. For declaring that he's God. Uh, in fact, turn over to chapter 10. Chapter 10. Just, just one page to the right. Look at verse 30. Verse 30, Jesus says, I and my Father are one. Again, that's a statement of deity. He's saying, I'm God. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works I have shown you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? Verse 33, the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we do not stone you, <clears throat> but for blasphemy, because you being a man, make yourself God. With his I am statements, Jesus is declaring he is God. And the audience understood he was claiming deity here. And so verse 12, he says, I am the light of the world. Now, let's, let's just kind of dig a little bit deeper into uh, verse 12 now that we kind of understand the context. Um, if you remember at the beginning of chapter 8, uh, chapter 8 began with Jesus going into the temple early in the morning, 
um, probably before sunrise, probably while those lampstands were still burning bright. Uh, again, he's, he's in the court of the women at the treasury where those lampstands stood. Uh, verse 1 tells us that Jesus began to teach in the treasury. He sat down and began to teach the crowd that was gathered there around him in the treasury. And as he was teaching, he was interrupted. Do you remember this from last week? Uh, he was interrupted by the religious leaders who brought a woman they had caught in the act of adultery. And they brought this woman in and they placed her right in the middle of the crowd that Jesus was teaching, interrupted his teaching. And Jesus has this exchange with those religious leaders. Then the religious leaders left one by one. And then Jesus sent the woman away saying, go and send no more. And then he turned back to the crowd and began teaching them again. Look at verse 12 again. Verse 12 says, Then Jesus spoke to them again. Jesus didn't miss a beat here. You know, he's, he's in the middle of teaching. He gets interrupted. Uh, and, and then he deals with those religious leaders. He sends the woman away. And then he turns right back to the crowd and says, As I was saying, you know, it just goes, rolls right with it. He doesn't miss a beat at all. He's not... He's not uh, thrown off by this unexpected interruption or by this confrontation that he has with the religious leaders. You know, the Bible says to us that the fruit of the Spirit includes peace. Peace. As we walk in the Spirit and are led by the Spirit, uh, we have the peace of the Holy Spirit. We've got the peace of God. We've got a peace that passes all understanding. And it's a peace that will keep us from getting derailed by an unexpected interruption in our day. Or derailed by some issue that comes up in the middle of the day. We're able to take those things in stride because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And so Jesus, he turns back to the crowd. He says, I'm the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. He, he's the light of the world. Now, the Gospel of John likes to talk about light a lot. Uh, 24 times in this Gospel, John mentions light. Uh, we've seen in earlier chapters, in John chapter 1, uh, in John chapter 3, light came into the world, right? Speaking of Jesus. Jesus is the light and look at the promise that Jesus makes here in verse 12. He says, he who follows me shall not walk in darkness. It's a promise. It's a definite promise. You shall not walk in darkness. The follower of Jesus. And what does that mean? A follower of Jesus. A follower of Jesus denies himself, takes up his cross, and then follows Christ. The follower of Jesus does not walk in darkness. They have the light of Jesus Christ. And what does light do? Light illuminates. The follower of Jesus Christ has been illuminated by Jesus Christ and they no longer walk in darkness. Uh, listen to this verse out of 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him, listen, who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Jesus Christ called us out of darkness. We were walking in darkness and Jesus called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you may remember when Jesus first shined his light into your life and began to illuminate things for you. You know, and the light came on and, and he began to uh, illuminate things about you. He began to show you things about yourself. He began to shine his light on things that you were doing, shine his light on maybe your lifestyle the way that you were living, how you were spending your time. He began to shine his light on the world around us and why things are the way that they are in this world and why people are the way that they are. And you, you suddenly now, you were walking in, in the light of Jesus Christ 
and he was he was illuminating things uh, in your life, and, and and you you know things were were becoming a, you know known to you that you never realized uh, before, maybe for the first time in your life. You're no longer walking in darkness, but you're walking in the light of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're a non-believer here, you are walking in darkness. Whether you realize that or not, you're walking in darkness. You know, it's, it's the funny thing about walking in darkness. Most people don't realize they're walking in darkness when they're walking in darkness. It's not until the light shines in their life that they realize that, hey, I was walking in darkness before. And I didn't even know it. Most people don't realize it, that they're walking in darkness. A, a non-believer is, is walking in spiritual darkness, and they may not even know it. And not only that, Ephesians chapter 2 says that when, when, before we were believers, when we were walking in darkness, we were also following the course of the world. Just wherever the world led us, just what it, just kind of the, the world has a flow to it, and we were just following the flow of the world, just kind of blindly, in darkness, just kind of doing whatever the world says to do, whatever the world says is right, and just going along with that. But then, when the light of Jesus Christ shines in a person's life, His light changes everything. Right? It just changes everything. And he calls us out of that darkness to walk into, uh, walk in his light and live in his light. And so now verse 13, uh, the Pharisees in verse 13, uh, who, who happened to be in the crowd there, uh, they challenged Jesus on what he said. The Pharisees therefore said to him, will you bear witness of yourself? Your witness is not true. You say you're the light of the world, but you're, you're, you're talking about yourself. And your witness of yourself, your testimony about yourself, that, that's not valid. Uh, in other words, the Pharisees' argument was basically, hey, just because you say you're the light of the world, that doesn't make you the light of the world. I mean, anyone can say anything they want about themselves. That doesn't make it true. It doesn't prove it. And so they're challenging him here. In verse 14, Jesus said, he answered them, well, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true for, here's why, for I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. Jesus says his testimony uh, is reliable because he knew where he came from and where he was going. Now, we know he came from God and he's going to God, but why does he say this in verse 14? Why does he, why does he say, you know, uh, my witness is true because I know where I came from and I know where I'm going? How does that prove that his testimony is true? Well, the Jewish people at that time, they taught that when the Messiah comes, the Messiah will testify of where he came from and where he's going. That the Messiah is eternal. And that the Messiah will declare he's eternal. And that he's from eternity past and he's going to eternity. That he's eternal. If you're a note taker, you can jot down a couple verses here. Micah 5.2 and Hosea 5.15. Micah 5.2 and Hosea 5.15. Now Micah 5.2 is a verse that is familiar probably to most of us, if not all of us here. It's in Micah 5.2 that it declares that the Messiah will be born where? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. It predicts his birth will be in Bethlehem. Uh, but, the, but the verse goes on to say that the Messiah will come forth from of old, from everlasting, meaning he will come forth from eternity past. The Messiah who will be born in Bethlehem, he's going to come forth from of old, from eternity past past. He'll be eternal. Hosea 5.15, there the Lord speaking. And Hosea 5.15, the Lord says, I will return to my place until they admit their guilt and turn to me. So there in Hosea, the Messiah is saying he will return to his place until they admit 
their guilt and turn to me. So he will, uh, he will return to where he came from. He'll return to eternity, which is exactly what Jesus Christ did, right? He came down from heaven. He came from God. He was on this earth for 33 years thereabout, and then he ascended back up to heaven. He went back into eternity. He came from God. He went from God, went to God. He knows where he came from, and he's declared that, and he knows where he's going. He's declared that as well. So here in verse 14, when Jesus makes the, he's making his argument, saying, my, my witness of myself is true because I know where I came from, and I know where I'm going. He's communicating. He's the Messiah. He's the Messiah. And he says, but you don't know where I came from. You don't know where I'm going. And then he says in verse 15, you judge according to the flesh. The, the, uh, the religious leaders, they judged Jesus according to the flesh. They said, isn't he from Nazareth? Isn't this the carpenter's son? They judged him solely on his humanity and not on his divinity. You know, they, they saw him just as this carpenter from Nazareth and not God incarnate from eternity past who was going back to eternity, who came from God and who was going to God. It was from everlasting to everlasting. He goes on in verse 16 to say, And yet I, if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. And so he says here that the Father also is a witness to his identity. If you remember at the baptism of Jesus, when he came up out of the water, the Father spoke from heaven and said, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. The Father testified to the identity of Jesus, and there was a crowd there at that baptism that heard the voice from heaven. And so Jesus says here, hey, according to the law, a matter is established as true by the testimony of two witnesses. There's my testimony, of who I am, and then there is the testimony of the Father. To which the Pharisees said in verse 19, where is your Father? Jesus answered, now watch what he says here in verse 19. It's an important verse. You know neither me nor my Father. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Do you catch what he's saying there? Jesus, again, he said, uh, if you had known me, you would have known my Father. In other words, what he is saying is you can only know the Father through me. You can only know G the Father through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. So a person who doesn't know Jesus Christ doesn't know God. A person who tries to come to God another way other than Jesus Christ, maybe through a, a, a different faith or a different spiritual path, they can't come to God because you can only come to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only way to the Father. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, Jesus said, There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. There is only one way, one mediator between God and man. There's one go-between between between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ. And so a person cannot know God apart from Jesus Christ. Now listen, give me your attention just so we're clear about this. That's not my claim. That's not my narrow view. That's what Jesus said, and that's what the Bible teaches, that the only way to God is through a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the only way. Yeah, but I have this friend. Hey, the only way to God is through Jesus Christ. Yeah, but my neighbor is not a Christian and he, I'm just telling you what Jesus said and what the Bible teaches. The only way to know God is through 
Jesus Christ. So if someone is not coming to God through Jesus Christ, they're not coming to God because he's the only way. So verse 20 now, they were told these words Jesus spoke in the treasury, the court of the women, where those lampstands were, as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him for his hour had not yet come. His hour to die had not yet come. Verse 21, then Jesus said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I go, you cannot come. And so the Jews, they were confused by this. They said, will he kill himself? Will he commit suicide? Because he says, where I go, you cannot come. And he said to them, you are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. If you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Dying in your sins means spiritual death. It means separation from God. It means hell. Jesus says, if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Now, some say, well, does it really matter what you believe as long as you believe in something, as long as as your belief helps you? Isn't that enough? Isn't that all that matters? Jesus said it's absolutely vital what you believe. And it is vital what you believe about Jesus. It's not enough to just believe he lived or that he was a person that lived in Israel 2,000 years ago. It's not enough to believe he's a good moral teacher. It's not enough to believe he was a prophet. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am, Whose I am? God. Unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Unless you believe that Jesus is God, that he's God incarnate, you will die in your sins. Now, why is that important? Why does that matter? Why do we have to believe that Jesus died, that Jesus is God? Because only God can forgive your sins. Do you understand? Our sins we committed against God. He's the only one that can forgive us of our sins. And the way that God forgives us of our sins is God became a man, God incarnate. He came down to this earth as a person, the person of Jesus Christ. And he died in our place on the cross to provide us with forgiveness. In 2 Corinthians 5.19, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God was in the person of Jesus Christ reconciling the world to himself. Jesus died for us in our place. So that we could be forgiven. But that's not the end of the story, right? Because after he died, he was buried. And then three days later, what happened? He was resurrected from the dead. And he's alive today. He's risen from the dead. He's living. He's a living God. This is what makes Jesus unique. That he died and he came back from the dead. And so because he came back from the dead, the resurrection tells us that his sacrifice on the cross for us was accepted in heaven. Acts 4.12 says there is salvation in no other name. There is no other way for man to be saved but through Jesus Christ. So then verse 25, they said to him, who are you? (laughs) He's claiming to be God. He's, He's claiming that he is I am. So now they say, who are you? And Jesus said to them, just what I have been saying to you from the beginning, I have many things to say and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. And they did not understand that he spoke to them of the Father. Then Jesus said to them, verse 28, look at verse 28. When you lift up the Son of Man, speaking of his crucifixion, then you will know that I am. Isn't that a statement? When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. When Jesus is crucified, then you will know that Jesus is God. 
by the way that he dies. And if you remember the story of the crucifixion, when Jesus was crucified, he didn't die any uh, ordinary death. First of all, we're told in the Gospels that as Jesus was on the cross, that the whole earth was covered with darkness in the middle of the day for three hours from noon to 3 p.m. Total darkness. Not just that it was cloudy, but the earth became pitch black darkness. And by the way, there's records outside of the Bible that talk about the darkness upon the earth at that time. Not that we need that, but we've got the testimony of other documents that testify to that happening. That never happened before. It's never happened since. So that's unique. Secondly, when Jesus died, he didn't just, he didn't just die. The Bible describes him dismissing his spirit from his body. Saying, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And, and it says he gave up the ghost. He dismissed his spirit. You know, your spirit, that's the real you. He just sent it away. He sent it out of his physical body. That's not how people die. They don't just dismiss their spirit. Third, when he did die, we're told that the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. We're, you know, we're, we're told in, in rabbinical writings that the thickness of the fabric of the temple curtain was the thickness of the width of your hand. And it's torn from top to bottom. Remember how tall, do you remember the picture, how tall the temple was? It's not torn from bottom to top. God is the one who tore it from top to bottom. We're told uh, not only that, that there was a great earthquake. And in Matthew's gospel, it says some of the dead were resurrected back to life and were seen walking in the streets of Jerusalem when Jesus died. We're told that a Roman soldier who was guarding those that were on the cross, those that were being crucified, that when Jesus died, that Roman soldier who's a pagan, He's a pagan. He said, surely this is the son of God. That guy's job was to crucify people. He saw people die every day by crucifixion. He had never seen a death like that before. And the, the pagan Romans said, this guy's God. Just based on seeing his death. And what did Jesus say here? When you lift up the son of man, then you will know I am. Then you'll know that I'm God. And they did. Even that Roman knew that Jesus is God. Now, let's finish up here. Verse 29. And he who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. For I always do those things that please him. And as he spoke these words, many believed in him. You know, Jesus came down from heaven to the earth to shine his light into this dark world and more importantly, to shine his light into our dark hearts personally. He died on the cross to provide a way of salvation for us, a way for us to be forgiven. And three days later, he's resurrected from the dead. And he's alive today. And his resurrection validates everything he said and everything he claimed. Everything he claimed to be. That he is the light of the world. And he who follows him shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And Lord, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for these verses. We thank you, Jesus, that you came down to this earth. We thank you, Lord, that you shined your light into our hearts and you revealed yourself. We thank you, Lord, that you continue to shine your light in our hearts, Lord. You continue to illuminate things. For us. We thank you that you died and you were buried, that you rose again, and that you made a way for us to be forgiven, and that you made a way for us to be reconciled back to God. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living
God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, and use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. If you're here today and you need prayer before you go, just come down front. We'll have some men and women down here that can pray with you, pray for you. So take advantage of that before you leave. Be safe driving home. I don't know if it's snowing yet. Just be careful. May the Lord bless you, may the Lord keep you, may He cause His face to shine upon you this week, may He be gracious to you, and give you peace. Peace that passes all understanding. In Jesus' name.